Hello! Welcome to a new month. It is February, the month of love. Well, not really the month of love, it's like the first two weeks are the month of love and then everyone moves on with their lives, don't they? So, the first two weeks. <laughs> and I'm never big into Valentine's Day anyway, but this year, for sure, any romance in our lives is gonna be fictional, I hope. Don't be going anywhere during a pandemic. No hookups. No, 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 no. You have to deal with escapism through books and TV like the rest of us. And romance isn't typically my genre. Um, I don't want to be snobby about it, but like I tend to only really invest in romance or ships in books if there's something else going on. I think the closest to a contemporary romance that I've read is Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, which Romance is a huge focus of that book, but there is sort of politics, sort of, uh, going on in the background. Romance is not the only factor in that book, but a lot of the narrative is taken up by the romance. So I think it is something that I can enjoy, I just have not opened myself up to it yet. Uh, and I thought, you know, this year, while we're in solitary confinement, it would be a nice time to indulge in some steamy escapist romance. So I have two reading vlogs coming your way, this is the first of two, and in this one we're going to be reading a super historical Regency romance. I don't know if it's Regency actually, I need to ask Charlotte because she knows more about history than I do if this counts as Regency. I will be messaging her and I'll probably put it somewhere in this video. <laughs> But we're reading A Gentleman by Any Other Name by Casey Michaels and this is a Mills and Boone novel and I know that Mills and Boone are known for romance, erotica, escapism, I'm not entirely sure what their MO is but I know that it's that, it's romance. Now again, don't want to be snobby, I have never read a book like this. Although I did binge watch Bridgerton uh, along with everyone else that watched Bridgerton um, and I'm not huge on period drama so I didn't swoon for it as much as other people did. Um, there's definitely a shift in the middle of Bridgerton where it stopped being about like petty silly drama which I thrive on and then it became about women's duties and like marriage and having children. You'll know what I mean if you've seen it, there's like an event in the middle that happens and then it kind of changes the tone of the show and I was like, oh, I was just here for the Gossip Girl setup, you know? But in a way this book now feels a bit more topical and part of the kind of cultural zeitgeist because everyone is, you know, swooning over period dramas, there are people scrambling to try and get their hands on the Bridgerton novels, so I feel like it will be a good time to give this a go. And I do have to say I didn't buy this with the express purpose of reading it. I bought this in a charity shop for 79p with the intention of using it as a prop for a documentary we were making in film school about female self-pleasure and masturbation and obviously like erotica novels and you know regency romance, historical romance are synonymous with like women's pleasure and all of this stuff. You know there's that episode of Friends where Joey finds Rachel's porn book and it is like a, a silly romance between like the stable boy and the princess or whatever and he makes fun of her for having porn and I feel like this book definitely has those vibes that Rachel's book has. So without further ado, let's dive into the blurb, let's see what we're getting into. So it says historical romance, rich, vivid and passionate. What is he hiding? Chance Beckett has spent all of his 30 years trying to forget his impoverished beginnings. Now he must confront his past and return to the windswept coast of Romney Marsh, where the ghosts of his childhood still linger. It's like great expectations. I mean, it's not, but <laughs> carry on. Governess Julia Caruthers finds her new employer dangerously compelling, but when she sees something she should not, Julia wonders if Chance's sudden attentions are prompted by improper desires, or the need to protect his family's secrets. It's definitely what I thought! <laughs> no, I'm trying to go into this with an open mind, but I'm excited. <laughs> Also what fascinates me about this book is that in the back um, there is an advert for a Fabergé inspired tribute to a departed loved one and it's just this like Dimonte egg which has, it's called a loving remembrance musical egg and it plays touching melody of amazing grace. I'm gonna put in a clip so that you don't think I'm like unhinged and making this up and it has a little poem on it and then you can like cut out the back cover and like send off for this Diamante egg. I mean why don't modern books give you the ability to order a Fabergé inspired egg for a departed loved one? 
I for one would buy it. Why is that a trend that stopped? Oh my god, there's one on the front cover as well. That is so funny <laughs> that you could just cut out this hole and then there would just be like a gaping gap in the front cover. Oh my god. Anyway, I think I got a bit distracted by the Fabergé inspired egg element of this book, um, but I will be starting this tonight and I am very excited to um, see it unfold and bring you with me because I'm not suffering this alone. Oh, here you are, face to face in this trashy bar. Another glass and I am going places makes me laugh about the irony of everything. So it starts with this guy, <laughs> this dude, this hunky dude, he is like recently widowed, although he didn't love his wife, that becomes clear quite quickly, so that then what then transpires doesn't reflect badly on him, it's like, it's okay, he didn't love his wife, it's fine. <laughs> so yeah, his wife has died and he's looking for someone to look after his child, um, who's five years old, and then this woman Julia comes in and like, She's maddening, obviously, and, you know, obviously, right off the bat, she notices his stormy green eyes. We know, we know the score, don't we? Like, he is brooding and cagey, she's annoying, she asks him lots of questions about his past, he doesn't want to answer, but then, like, he finds himself telling her stuff, and then later on he's like, why did I tell her? How did she get that out of me? She's so, like, conniving this maddening woman. <laughs> so then once she's been hired as the new governess, she and him and the kid and like the servants and stuff, they all go to Romney Marsh to Beckett Hall, which is like his family's mansion. And he's got like brothers and sisters and his father all there. And basically there's this like smuggling subplot. And I mean, I'm not sure of like the historical backdrop. I don't know a lot about history. I, I love history but I only know the very specific periods that we studied at school obviously because they don't have time to teach you everything. But this takes place in 1811 which I checked with Charlotte by the way counts as regency. It counts as a regency era novel because that it falls within the the time of <laughs> regency. But there's this whole thing of like people smuggling stuff from France or like, I don't know, basically there are people at the docks and you know at the sea, at the coast that are like smuggling things into the country um, and then this chance guy, like the, the, the main guy, this dude, he works for the war office and it's his job to like investigate the smugglers. So they're on this big coach trip to the mansion and then they like bump into some smugglers and then one of them dies or something and to be honest I, I wasn't paying full attention I was just waiting for like the steamy stuff to start happening but there's this whole undercurrent of like smuggling so once they arrive at the house Julia obviously has a lot of questions about Chance's family and like she thinks that they might be involved in the smuggling trade because she finds out that some of his servants used to be sailors I don't know so she like accuses him of all this stuff and then he's like, no, don't worry. But then he realizes that someone is listening in. And so then he changes the conversation to be like, oh, Julia, I haven't kissed you in so long. And then she obviously like realizes what he's insinuating somehow. She realizes that like, oh, somebody's listening. Like I'm gonna play along. And so then she starts like flirting back a bit. 
um, so that like whoever is listening in thinks that they're like being secretive and talking about their affair when in fact they're being secretive and talking about smugglers. <laughs> so then they've set up this kind of like fake dating type thing so like obviously like this now spreads and then the next day his whole family believes that like she's his mistress but like no one's actually saying it out loud so it's this kind of like fake dating trope but then like the day after this happens they kiss so it's like how is it fake dating when they're just like dating <laughs> and I just got to the kiss so again they were talking about smuggling or whatever um, and then she was like oh as long as we like just keep up the charade and we know what we really are to each other and then he's like what do you mean I don't know and then they kiss um, and it's just quite funny the way it's described and like obviously this isn't an old book this was written in what 2007 it was published so it's not like an outdated book but just some of the descriptions are just so funny and like it's obviously trying to emulate that kind of regency style but it's just so funny I don't think it's meant to be funny but I found it quite funny <laughs> so then <laughs> sorry then again, Julia had just told him what he'd finally learned after fighting that truth for more than a dozen years. He was no gentleman. She fit against his body, his hands, with the sleek strength and suppleness of a racehorse, the fine, clean lines of a greyhound, made for speed, for grace, and with a great heart for the race. Ridiculous. She was a woman, no different from any other woman. Many would call her too thin for love-making. But none had ever kissed her, had ever held her. Chance broke the kiss, knowing he was becoming fanciful. He had to concentrate on the matter at hand and Cortland's idiocy. Yeah, I don't know who this Cortland person is yet. I think he's like a brother, but he's not been introduced properly yet. No one will question our association now, Julia, not even Jacko. That's the guy that's the ex-sailor that Julia suspects is involved in the smuggling. He said, touching her softly pink and swollen bottom lip with the tip of his finger. You look well and truly kissed. So like, it's a charade, but it's not a charade because they just kissed. But they're both probably gonna lie to themselves and be like, oh yeah, it was all for the charade. And then very quickly just develop feelings for each other. Before Julia could think, she stepped back and slapped Chance hard across the face. And what will your family think of that, sir? He put his hand to his cheek. Damn, it stung. He'd probably wear the mark of her hand on his skin for most of the day. They'll think, Julia, that at last chance has met his match with this woman of his, that, and that it's damn well time. I don't understand. Why would your family allow your, your mistress under the same roof with your daughter, your sisters, are you Beckett's that uncivilized? Do we give a tinker's damn what anyone else thinks of us? No, Julia, we don't. However, I am probably the exception, so please don't shriek and faint when I introduce you to my sisters as my a fancied wife. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting a bit carried away. This is going to be like a live reading, and this video is going to be like five hours long. Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> anyway, they've arrived at the mansion. They're fake dating in order to cover up what they know about this smuggling subplot but then they're not fake dating because they're making out and stuff so it's, it's very silly but I'm having a good time the language is definitely like evocative of like that Bridgerton era like I remember when I binged watched Bridgerton I just kept saying things to myself like oh yes one will be down for dinner forthwith like you just kind of start getting into that cadence once you put your your head in that space and like once you get into it like it is quite hard not to get swept up in it so I'm enjoying myself and I was thinking to myself like oh like I'm having fun but like you know I probably wouldn't read another book like this you know it is quite silly and I'm not like properly investing in the characters it does just feel quite dramatic for drama's sake and like very much a fantasy right these don't feel like real people that like you invest in it's like just kind of pure escapism and that's fine but like that's what it feels like to me and then I realized that like a lot of the hallmarks of this book and maybe this genre as a whole because I don't know enough about the genre to start making claims but this whole setup is low-key like very gothic like I love gothic fiction I love the bloody chamber and that starts kind of similarly to this when there's like a young naive virginal woman 
who gets taken away to this isolated marshland with this like mysterious man who's like her betrothed or whatever and so this is kind of like a similar story but in like a very different font you know so it's interesting like I enjoy it in one sense like the bloody chamber is one of my favorite ever books and I love gothic as a genre you know the whole like damsel virginal woman who then gets corrupted by this dastardly dark figure and it's low-key the same so I don't know why I've, I've not allowed myself to fully delve into like this genre um, and I don't know if my opinion will change at the end of reading this, but we'll see. We're on page 145, and we have the first sex scene. Well, I assume so. We've had the first mention of his manhood, so I assume that's where this is going. But oh my god, this is, this is so funny. <laughs> She's floating on a cloud! <laughs> Okay, what is it with these animal comparisons during steamy scenes, like gentling her as he would a timid young colt? Don't compare her to a horse, dude. Come on. She's crossed into womanhood. Womanhood. She's a woman now. <laughs> Hello, me and my snazzy new jammies. Sorry, that was a crop shot. I just realised that. Anyway. Me and my snazzy new jammies, which I won't pan down for, are coming in to say, What the fuck? Why does he call her Sweetings? This has happened several times, and I didn't point it out the first time, because I thought, oh, I don't want to think about that. But it, it keep, keeps, hap keeps happening, and I don't like it. Ew. So he's just, he's just put his finger, you know, and it says, <laughs> impaling her, even as he began to move his tongue in tight circles around her, so that the darkness behind her eyelids suddenly seemed bright blue and then sparkling white, then blended into all the colours of the rainbow. Is he an alien? What the fuck is happening? Oh, I think she died metaphorically. Oh, quite excited there. I'm finished. It's like half one in the morning and this video has to be up at 10 a.m. in like nine hours. I really don't know why I do this. I'm living life on the edge and I hate it. It's stressing me out. So this is gonna be a very quick, rambly wrap up of my thoughts and then I need to edit like the wind. Also I'm really aware that all of my reading vlogs I'm very like schlubby in my pyjamas and just reading in bed all the time and I'm sorry about that but like we're in a lockdown at least now I've got some fancy new pyjamas because my other ones the elastic uh, went and I had a very embarrassing moment where I was doing the dishes and then the elastic just it just went. Um, and then obviously I couldn't do anything about it because my hands were wet and I was really delicious. Anyway, <laughs> that's a very clear visual that you probably didn't need. Anyway, let's get on to the, the wrap up. This book ends in a very stupid way. Um, the big like finale of this book is not them finally getting together and whatever because they, they have sex pretty early on so like where's the tension? But it's this big like, there are these, 
like rival smuggling gangs. So there's a smuggling gang that like the Becketts, the family who live at this big house, they're basically helping this gang of smugglers. But then there's a rival gang of smugglers that's like more dangerous and they have connections to London. And if that gang finds out that the other gang is like connected to the Becketts, then they, they would all go to prison and Chance would be like put in prison because he's like also working for the king. So. I don't know who gives a shit, right? Like you see the cover of this book and you're not like, oh, I'm gonna be in for a rip roaring tale of smugglers. Like that's not what you sign up for. You see this cover and you're not signing up for smugglers, are you? Like, but that's what you get. You get the smugglers. And also this family is like ex-pirates and that's just not gone into at all. Like they had some weird privateering business, like they're from the islands. Um, and there's also this woman called Odette who lives with them and she's kind of like a nanny slash witch doctor? They don't use the term witch doctor but she's the only black character and she's from Haiti and she like puts spells on all of them and gives them charmed objects and I just feel like that was a little bit strange? <laughs> I don't know, it gave me bad vibes. So yeah anyway there's this big showdown between the two rival gangs and like everything's fine and then suddenly at the end in like literally the last five pages um like the police lieutenant guy who was kind of onto them throughout like kidnaps the five-year-old daughter chance's daughter and then that's somehow fine that's literally wrapped up within like three pages because julia our heroine who's done fuck all throughout this book she runs up and is like take me instead and then that works and he lets go of the little girl um and then he just starts sinking in some quicksand so like she didn't do anything i mean she did she like ran up and was like take me instead and then like the the kid is fine she like ran away um to her father but like the quicksand got him she didn't she didn't do anything and i think the most telling thing about what i thought of this book is that there's like a little sneak preview at the end of for like the next book in the series and i didn't read it <laughs> it was like as soon as i was done i'm done you know and you know what at least i finished it i was considering not finishing it because this vlog is you know very going up very late and i was like i could just do a wrap up without having finished it because i kind of know what i think already to be honest i kind of knew what i thought within like the first 50 pages but i persevered and you know what at least it was like entertaining enough like i definitely had some giggles some of the sex scenes were hilarious um i never want to read the word manhood or mound ever again also sweetings not a fan of that um, also, I could go a while without hearing the word maddening ever again, uh, that was used a lot. And I think my big problem, and I had this problem with Bridgerton as well, is sexism. <laughs> like this book was written in 2006, right, so it wasn't written, you know, whatever, it's like, you know, feminism was around at this time, but obviously at the time of writing, like in where this is set, you know, it was women's job to get married, have the children. Um, and Julia, the main heroine in this book, is 21 years old and like she refers to herself as like a spinster. Ridiculous. And in these stories the heroines are always like feisty and they're like, I want a better life. Like you know Eloise in Bridgerton, she's like, I want more. And I'm like, yeah girl, you deserve it. And what I can never get behind though is that the love interests, the men, are always just kind of like... And I'm like, I cannot be attracted to a sexist man. It's just not happening. Like, that doesn't do anything for me. So, like, when Julia first arrives, there's this one bit where, like, she knows a lot about what's going on or something. And basically, in Chance's, like, it's not a POV, but it's like, you know, you're in his narrative voice or whatever, third person, but it's his point of view. And it's like, you know, this maddening woman, whatever. Um, and to keep her silence, he could either kill her or bed her because like once women have been bedded they're easier to control or whatever the fuck and I was like dude fuck am I supposed to root for this dude no I hate him he's awful Ugh. and later on he's like trying to seduce her and like telling her all of these like things he wants to do with her and she was like what if some young man wanted to do that with your sister before they were married and he's like well I'd lock up my sister and tan her hide and I was like one weird to mention your sister while you're in some weird flirty foreplay and also like 
not cool, like slut shaming your sister for something that you are literally in the process of doing. I just, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. My two big issues with the book were just, I didn't care about the smuggling subplot, did not give a shit. Like usually I don't read romance because I'm like, oh romances are not enough to compel me, I want something else going on. But like not if that something else is more boring than the romance, do you know what I mean? It's just, mm. Props to her though, must have taken a lot of research to like do that subplot, I just didn't find it interesting, it was boring. And then the romance was peppered in um, with the smuggling stuff, and then the romance just underwhelming. Sex scenes were funny, but I didn't really give a shit if they got together or not. I didn't like him. He's the sexist man, so did not vibe. <laughs> Ultimately this confirmed the problem that I have with like period dramas. I've never seen Pride and Prejudice. I've never read Pride and Prejudice. Like, you know, I've not seen the 2005 version with Keira Knightley and a lot of my film friends think that's sacrilege. And I actually do want to watch it at some point. But you get the picture, I'm not a big period piece gal and I think it is just because I don't vibe with a sexist man. <laughs> I just can't get on board, I'm sorry. Having said that, I think if you enjoyed Bridgerton and if that like is your shit and you love stuff like that, this was very much in that vein. You have the big fancy house, the big family, the kind of like, ooh, we shouldn't be doing this, I'll be a ruined woman. All of that stuff is in here. Um, I've probably spoiled a lot of the plot elements though, so you might not want to read it after this, but there's like more books in this series, so if you're looking to fill the hole that Bridgerton has left in your life, and that is your shit, then maybe uh, this author or this series is something that you might consider checking out. But yeah, this reading vlog was semi-productive because I think I've just cemented in my mind, like, I know why I don't vibe so much with this genre, but at least I gave it a fair shot, like, I gave it a go. And if anyone knows any period dramas, like period books or period films where there's, like, not a lot of sexism, that would be cool. I really liked the film Emma. Um, that came out last year, mostly because of the production design and, and Taylor Joy being a goddess. But I also think there wasn't a lot of sexism in that, like from memory. Like the men were played for laughs and it was like the women were in control of the storyline like the whole time. And that's why I think I liked it. So I might read Emma, I don't know, we'll see. But if you have any recommendations for the period drama vibe, but without the sexist men, that would be great. Leave them in the comments. <laughs> so yeah, I hope you enjoyed this reading vlog if I ever get it up in time and I will see you soon with another video. And stay tuned for my second romance reading vlog which will be going up on Valentine's Day where I read some more modern contemporary steamy romances and hopefully I'll enjoy them a little bit more than this one. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you soon with another video soon.